have two experienced presenters who have prepared a webinar on the role of the prosecutor in drug treatment courts today. First, I would like to present Mike Leffler. Mr. Leffler is an assistant district attorney with the Creek County District Attorney's Office in Oklahoma. He is also the municipal judge for the town of Kellyville, Oklahoma. As a member of the University of Tulsa faculty, Mr. Leffler has caught, taught contract law and introduction to the law. He has served in different capacities for the National Association of Drug Corps Professionals and for the National Drug Corps Institute. Mr. Leffler has also conducted a webinar for us in the past and we are grateful to have him back today. We also have Judge Christine Carpenter joining us. Judge Carpenter is the Circuit Judge of Division I in the 13th Judicial Circuit, located in Columbia, Missouri. She is the Supervising Judge for the 13th Judicial Circuit Treatment Courts, which includes the Adult Drug Court and Veterans Treatment Court, among other problem-solving courts. Judge Carpenter has been a member of the National Drug Court Institute faculty since 2002 and has taught at the, national, the annual NDCI Comprehensive Drug Court Prosecutor Training. She also presided over the Boone County Drug Court when it was chosen to be a national mentor court from 2010 to 2013. We're happy both of you could join us today and share some of your knowledge on this topic. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Let's, um, let's kind of start off here and, uh, and, and kick off. Um, uh, I want to say something at the, at the outset because uh, a lot of this stuff is about um, um, uh, therapeutic justice. It, it's about understanding uh, criminalistic needs and the like. Um, what, what I would really like to, at the outset, say is that nobody is uh, suggesting in any way that uh, any of us abandon our traditional roles as uh, guardian of public safety. Um, what we're going to talk about here is how to deal with uh, uh, well, we're going to talk about a couple of things. One is how to deal with uh, and understand um, uh, risk and needs and whom to uh, refer to uh, uh, to therapeutic courts and, and drug courts will be our, our major focus in that regard. Uh, it, this is not to say that, uh, that this, this is for everyone or that we suggest that. Um, there are some people who have to be segregated from society and incapacitated uh, from the wrongdoing for, uh, for public safety. Uh, and that remains uh, that remains our uh, preeminent uh, goal. But let's drill down a little bit uh, a little bit deeper. Slide, please. One of the things that um, I, I think is 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 has been an overused metaphor uh, is that in uh, drug courts the prosecutors are the gatekeeper, and it seems to suggest and there's some I, I think there's some truth to this is that uh, we have been seen as a person standing by the gate uh, and everybody who comes we either let them in the gate or don't let them in the gate uh, a saint peter if you will uh, kind of uh, turning people away or bringing people in uh, and, and there's some truth to that but what i'd like to talk about today is maybe building the gate or or or, or uh, you know making it so that everyone understands what the rules are to get in so that we don't have to stand and make individual subjective uh, calls on everybody uh, who, who comes and, and, and knocks on the gate. Uh, so we are going to take the gatekeeper metaphor and, and kind of tilt it a little bit. And I want to tilt it in regard to talking about risk and need uh, because I think as I've, I've gone around the country, I do a lot of traveling, a lot of training. Uh, Judge Carpenter, uh, my co-presenter here, does that as well. Um, and so I, I, what I see a lot uh, in, in training, uh, weaknesses and deficiencies and the things that could be improved are the things that we're going to talk about in the, in the, following, uh, the following few slides. Okay, give us, a, give us a new slide, please. So I, I want to talk, and I'm going to bring Christine in on this slide, is uh, I think that the first thing a good, keep, good gatekeeper is is a gatekeeper from the start. We are there from the beginning. Uh, we're going to help determine uh, as a team member who we're going to, uh, what our target population is going to be, whom we're taking into uh, drug court, and necessarily by that is, is the people that we're excluding. Uh, and, and that means that, you know, we've got to get in front of the curve on this. Uh, if your drug court is about to start, uh, we need to be full partners and get in there and get our say of, uh, of who gets into uh, to this court. Because if we do not, 
uh, we will be, uh, you know, these people will kind of be forced upon us or we'll be necessarily passing on every, uh, every person as they come along. So a good gatekeeper is there at the start, before the game. Or if you're coming into this at a later stage, which many, many of us will, uh, because now drug courts have been around for 20 plus years, um, is that every once in a while that gate needs to be examined. And who are we letting in? And who are we not letting in? And uh, is that really what we want to do? And so we're going to talk about that as well. Uh, and uh, um, Christine, uh, when you were determining your target population, was your prosecutor involved in that regard? Well, yes. And as, as when we were introduced, you folks listening understand that both Mike and I have been involved in drug courts for a very long time. And, and the, the role of the prosecutor as the gatekeeper, I think, has evolved dramatically since the beginning of drug court. When we started drug courts, uh, we were pretty all limited to that pre-plea diversion model. And the prosecutor really was the gatekeeper because, uh, absolutely a gatekeeper, because the only people who could get into the program were the people that the prosecutor agreed to divert away from a traditional prosecutorial, prosecutorial process. So, as drug courts evolved and we started realizing that our target population might be moving away from that, if you might call low-hanging fruit, the people who were uh, worthy of a diversion, meaning usually a younger offender with no priors who uh, was possibly more involved with marijuana or alcohol than anything else and not a dealer and all the restrictions that we originally put on the people we allowed into drug court, no dealers, no weapons, no priors, um, that, that gatekeeper role has, has dramatically changed. And I think that a big part of what the prosecutor's role is currently is much more of a um, person who's assigned to the team to, to help develop policy, to to create stability and consistency on the team. The, the role of the prosecutor has changed a lot and it's become a lot more involved with the concept of who we get into the program now, now that it is not just a pre-plea diversion type case. Exactly, slide please. So in this regard, and to, to build off of what uh, Judge Carpenter said, is that, uh, and understand, I, I, I'm long in the tooth. Uh, we started our drug court 21 years ago. Uh, I was a young baby DA at the time, and uh, I was in on the discussion from the start, and the discussion was to protect my uh, self politically, my boss politically, not to allow in violent offenders, not to allow in people who were, um, <laughs> who uh, had, other, had, had prior convictions and, and really people that I thought would be the most likely to succeed in the court. And what I found out, first of all, is uh, that I was wrong. I wasn't able to predict those things. I wasn't, I wasn't that smart. Uh, and nobody really is um, uh, doing that on their own. Uh, and when I did predict, I was wrong a lot of the time. And uh, 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 really some of the lower level offenders would have been better left alone. And what I found out over the years, and I couldn't articulate at that time, um, was, was in fact what we were moving to was a higher risk offender, a more criminally involved offender, people with, uh, who, who just weren't uh, smoking pot on the weekends, uh, but who were really, um, you know, causing damage in, uh, in our community uh, in many ways, uh, including uh, cost of incarceration and the like. And so, over over the years, we developed this idea that hey, we're going to we're going to require you have a prior conviction because uh, we want to make sure that you were heading to prison because we want to divert people from prison. And what we were talking about there, and that was a step in the right direction, was uh, was having some uh, uh, eligibility criteria that were based on uh, something uh, you know other than uh, you know our gut reaction. Uh, and moving away from what uh, Judge Carpenter said as, as well, um, from the total prosecutorial uh, discretion, uh, f from, from hanging out at the gate to building the gate that only admitted the right people, in other words. 
And what finally, uh, and this is no, not patting myself on the back, but, but science, and we're going to talk a lot about data in this presentation. The data caught up with us and said, hey, you know what, uh, you need to make sure that you are admitting people uh, based on evidence-based assessment tools, in other words, that they need uh, a therapeutic intervention and a significant one. Uh, they have criminalistic needs, uh, and uh, those need to be addressed for public safety and for uh, preventing recidivism and relapse and the, and the like. And we need to do this in a way that's evidence-based and not just based on a prosecutor's gut, uh, uh, you know, gut call or some, something like that. And, and so, you know, as this comes around to about 2013, uh, NADCP developed uh, 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 standards. Uh, for practice in drug courts that includes this, and that's up on your slide right now. And it is the number one standard, because I think it is the most important, and I think, arguably, it's the most important one for prosecutors, and making sure that we have the right people in the program. Now, this standard has a couple of parts, and one is, is that uh, eligibility and exclusion from a program uh, uh, are, are objective, they're not subjective. Uh, they're not that, well, you know, I, I and I have this in I have this in my jurisdiction. I've been around long enough that I'm now prosecuting the grandchildren of the people I started uh, prosecuting many years ago, um, and that's hard to escape that kind of um, um, you know mindset. Uh, but what we've got to do is is have objective criteria um, that I can look on paper that I can look at and see whether someone's eligible. Public defender can see who's eligible, private defense counsel can see who's eligible, uh, uh, probation officers that want to put, that are, have people pro, uh, failing probation can put into the, the program, refer to the program. Uh, law enforcement people on the street uh, can arrest people and say, well, this is the person that would be uh, ripe for drug court. Uh, that's, that's what you get from, a, from objective criteria. And pretty soon you start to move from, uh, as we say in Oklahoma, a river that's a mile wide and an inch deep to a river that's, uh, uh, that's both wide and deep. Uh, you're taking all the people in your community that are, are, are having an ill effect. Uh, and the last kind of part here is, um, you know, we used evidence-based assessment. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna move slides now and, and talk about how we, talk, we use evidence-based um, assessment techniques to determine who comes into uh, uh, to drug court. So just, just to sum up here, a good gatekeeper targets the right population uh, to start with. Um, and, and let's go to the next slide. Mike, I'd like to add something to that analysis Please about do. objective versus subjective. I think that that's something that we still fight and we still see because we all feel like we have some kind of insight into the people that we work with. And we just have a feeling this person will do well or not do well. And I think that this movement away from objective criteria is a difficult task. And I know that there are many teams that use some of the criteria that we have, the evidence-based analysis and assessment, and find that the person qualifies, and then the team will discuss it after that and say, well, okay, he qualifies, what do you think? And then they add another layer to the, to the choices of who gets in and who gets out. And I've heard teams talk about, well, this person just isn't ready, or they, they're not at their, they're not, they haven't hit bottom yet, or they're not motivated enough, or they, they, um, they just don't seem to want this. And, and we want to give this to people who deserve it and who are going to do well. And that, that can be a real trap because if somebody is, a, as we're going to talk about high risk and high needs, they're not going to want to do this. They, they're going to be in the depths of their, of their addiction and this is not something that's going to look good to them. So really, it, it's, it's one of the more difficult things, particularly if you have a drug court that's been established for a while and has been using some subjective criteria, it's hard to get away from that. And I think that it's, um, important for us to recognize that in ourselves and realize that once we identify someone as meet, meeting our target uh, criteria, that we don't, we don't add on to that anything subjective. Good, good comments. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
So let's talk about high risk offenders. Um, let me disabuse you of something right now. Uh, by, by talking about high risk offenders, I'm not talking about people who are dangerous, uh, and dangerous in a physical uh, safety sense. Uh, that's, um, that's risk of dangerousness. Uh, that, is a, that is a separate and, uh, and, and much less scientific, uh, if, if, if my short studies show uh, field of science. Uh, if you've ever prosecuted a capital case, for example, the risk of dangerousness is one of the things that often comes in in the second stage. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about people who are at high risk of failure. Uh, they have failed, uh, um, you know, at every step of their life. Um, sometimes it appears to be their own decisions, and maybe they are. Um, but they have poor prognosis for success in standard programs. Um, a lot of these people don't even do well in, in, while they're incarcerated. Uh, they just can't, uh, they can't operate within systems. They make bad decisions. Uh, they are compelled to do things that we don't want them to do. Uh, these are high risk offenders. These are the people that you look at and, and you're screening cases. You're like, oh Lord, not him again. Or you see them in court and you're like, didn't I just send you to prison? These are the people that I'm talking about here. Um, again, not violent offenders, although they could be. But high-risk offenders are the most likely people to recidivate. Now, let me kind of pull up to a 50,000-foot level here and, and talk, talk about this is not people that we normally deal with, but it sometimes seems like the only people we deal with. And depending on where you are, uh, the statistics vary a little bit, and, uh, but I'm just going to give you a general sense. You know, up to two-thirds or more of people who come into the criminal justice system um, each year never come back. Uh, now to borrow a, a metaphor from baseball, if you're you know if you're hitting 700, um, you should get two busts in the Hall of Fame. Uh, and so I think we do a pretty good good job uh, in the criminal justice system of stopping people, deterring people from coming back, uh, punishing them for whatever that they did and going on. Uh, we we should we we should not look down on ourselves. So we see this other 30 odd percent, 30 percent who come back time after time after time. These are very likely your high-risk offenders. Uh, they fail probation. Um, they get out and they recidivate and they do the same thing that they did again and they appear not to be very good at it. Um, DUI offenders come, come to mind. It, it, it's like you get drunk and you get in a car and you've been arrested six times in the last 10 years. You think you might learn your lesson. High-risk offenders don't. Uh, they are not that huge piece of the pie I'm talking about that are, that are uh, low-risk offenders. Um, these are your high-risk people. Uh, now, next slide, please. Uh, High-need offenders. Or, or, or let me go. Let me go back a slide. I'm sorry. Let me let me finish talking about uh, high risk for a second. Um, this is not who we think high-risk offenders are. Um, it is not a subjective thing. To go back to to uh, uh, Christine's lead-in here, um, we have instruments that can measure risk. Uh, they, they're evidence-based, they're measured uh, objectively. Uh, some of you all use them, some of you all um, have probation officers that use them. Um, a lot of you probably use, are used in your system and you don't know they're being used because they're used before you or after you and you never know about this. Um, but high-risk offenders, it's been shown time after time, uh, is one of the, is, is where it's at for reducing crime and recidivism in this, but again, it is based on evidence-based assessments. It's not just who we think are high-risk offenders. Um, we have pretty good. We, we we can pretty well predict this. Uh, if you want to just if you want to just kind of freewheel it, but um, uh, much more so than high needs. Um, but again, these high-risk things, um, uh, these instruments are much more precise and give us a much better idea uh, than just kind of our, uh, our our rule of thumb. Christine. Well, when we started changing over from the, the earlier model of taking the lower risk offenders, uh, you know, people with no priors, relatively youthful folks with low level, lower level property crimes or possession crimes, um, you know, when we did well with those folks, we, we thought, well, aren't we great? You know, drug court works. It was when we started to um, concentrate on people who were coming back into our community from being incarcerated, the people with multiple convictions who were coming back on probation with absolutely no uh, support structure at all. And we thought maybe we, 
this fourth time coming back from the Department of Corrections, if we gave them a little more structure other than straight probation or parole, maybe that would help. And this, again, is back 15 years ago when we, when we weren't using these kinds of evidence-based practices. This was just a feeling that we had, but it was certainly surprising to us when we realized that the people that we never thought we would be able to help, the people who had multiple convictions, multiple incarcerations, long-term addictions, um, no education, very little employment history. Uh, and you would think, well, how, how are we going to do something different with these folks than has been done over the years? We ended up with a lot of success stories, much to our own surprise. So it, it's uh, this concept of people who have, you know, been using for years, been in the criminal justice system for years, their families have been there, they have black education, they have, you know, other problems such as, such as health problems and mental health problems. Those are the people that we really get a better uh, result with. We get a bigger bang for our buck. When we spend money on those people and they succeed, we're really saving the community uh, both, both money and, and resources. And so um, it, it, became, it became real apparent to us before we even had this concept of risk and need that that this was this was the way to go. And and how would you just ask yourself this question? This is hard for to do in a webinar, but just ask yourself this question: If you were going to deal with a high risk offender, this person who Christine has just described, who has come back time after time, who has failed probation numerous times, has went up on probation violations to prison, uh, they get another suspended sentence, but at some point uh, probation because they were, were just low level other low level crimes, and they fail that again, and you. Um, you've seen them, you've, you've, you've prosecuted their father, their grandfather, whatever it is. Uh, how, if you wanted them to not recidivate, what do you think that you would have to do? And I think that the, the, the common sense answer is you would, you would sit on them, right? You would babysit them 24 hours a day uh, and make sure that they were accountable for their actions when they started to go sideways, uh, that they were congratulated when they were doing what they were supposed to do and that that pattern of positive uh, reinforcement and negative uh, reinforcement and punishment uh, and the like would be repeated time after time after time, you might change that behavior. Now, does that model sound like anything that we are interested in here? Uh, and I think the answer is, yeah, it sounds kind of like a drug court program. So let's look at needs now. Next slide. A high need offender. And understand that this is, we're marrying these two, these two together, this risk and need, uh, to say that high need offenders with, have high clinical syndromes or disorders. Um, they are not, uh, they, they're not uh, people with a medical marijuana card that, that smoke weed with their, uh, with their hippie friends on the weekend. That's not who we're talking about here. Um, these are people who are compulsively using uh, illegal drugs or alcohol. Um, they, they, they do it, they do it constantly, they need to do it or they'll feel bad, they'll have withdrawal symptoms, uh, they binge time after time after time. Uh, this is the kind of person that we are, we are looking for. And, and kind, of, kind of think about your, about your people that you use. It is hard to predict who this person is based on uh, what crime they come in the criminal justice system. Uh, these, these things are really kind of independent uh, of those things. Uh, yeah, if you got someone with 75 pounds of marijuana wrapped in plastic bags and transporting in your state, yeah, you might zone that person out. But, uh, but a lot of these people come in with different crimes other than drug possession. They come in with uh, uh, hot checks. Uh, they, they come in with uh, uh, property crimes. And they, they come in with uh, repeated low-level possession crimes. Uh, they come in with public intoxication, things like that. Uh, this high-need offender, if you were going to treat them what do you think you would do there? I think the common sense answer is you would, you would try to treat these needs to, to uh, change these compulsions, change or uh, uh, alter uh, these clinical syndromes, make them better, ameliorate them. Uh, and uh, when they manifest themselves in behavioral issues, uh, such as use, uh, that that is detected reliably and quickly, uh, that there is a negative consequence for that. 
um, when they uh, when they uh, do not use uh, under certain circumstances. They're congratulated for that. They they, they have positive reinforcement. Um, you know, what is the best criminal justice system to, to, to handle that? That would be um, uh, 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 kind of like a drug court, I'd say. Uh, and it's not just substance abuse disorder, um, uh, but also psychiatric disorders. Um, we know that from research that uh, in the criminal justice system as a whole, um, some 40 percent of people are uh, uh, have serious mental health diagnoses, and that changes from one jurisdiction to the other, but just as a general rule of thumb, um, I would say that that would be a low ball um, um, prediction in my court at 40 percent. And then you've got uh, substance abuse use and uh, um, uh, involvement with about, uh, depending on, again, where you are, up to, to 80 percent of offenders. And you do that math and you see that there's a lot of um, co-occurring, co-occurring disorders, a lot of people dealing with both. Uh, and then you add in the functional impairments that come from that, not, not being able to read, not being able to, to hold a job, to find a job, uh, to get an education so you can training to get a job. Uh, and you start to paint a picture of a, of a pretty, um, a, a pretty hopeless uh, individual here, a high risk, a high need. But because both of these high risk and high need, um, uh, uh, um, qualifications are kind of dealt with in the same manner or dealt with best in the same manner. Uh, constant uh, 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 surveillance of what they're doing uh, and uh, rapid response to, uh, to uh, both good and, and bad compliance uh, by these people um, through the use of sanctions and incentives. That's how you change these behaviors. And so you start to see that if you are the gatekeeper and you're trying to build the gate or you're wanting to change uh, uh, what it takes to get into your program, looking at this uh, slide is, is, is kind of where you want to go if you really want to affect uh, your community. Next slide, please. These high-need folks, like I said, need intensive treatment and intensive rehabilitation services if they're high risk as well. Uh, they need to be uh, they need to be babysat to a great extent. Uh, they need to be sat on to monitor their behavior, uh, to uh, uh, to incentivize uh, non-use and, and and complying with treatment, and to disincentivize uh, uh, the uh, uh, the opposite. So uh, let's move on to the next slide. Christine, jump in anywhere you want. Okay, um, I, I would like to add something about the. The high risk and high need. I, I think that once once you get those two concepts of of the uh, the risk factors of being you know criminality and education and familial and uh, all those various things of people who've had no no success in their life and a lot of a lot of prior criminal activity. I mean, it's easy to see that person, and then when you add in the the high need, which you know, the, the addictive behaviors and the constant abuse of drugs and alcohol. But I think it's also, it's, it's important to remember, particularly when we talk about the prosecutor looking at cases in, these, in this sort of gatekeeper position again, um, you know, when you see somebody who is a high need offender, they're not necessarily high risk as well. And uh, now with, with the onset of the opiate abuse that we are seeing everywhere, we're seeing more and more people, I think, that really fit into that category of they are, they are high needs, they are addicted, and they are seriously addicted, and they're, they're overdosing, um, but they don't have those other criminal, criminogenic risk factors. And I, I, would, I, would, I would suggest to you that you, you'll see people coming through your system who, you know, nurses, they, they're married, they have families, they have homes, they have education, they're employed. They seem to be a, a stable people, but they find themselves addicted to opiates that they've obtained through their employment, perhaps, and, you know, just uh, started, out, started out with a bad back and ended up an opiate addict. And for them, this is a very different world. They, they are not familiar with the criminal justice system, but they are, they are now in it, uh, carrying a, a big addiction burden. And, and we're seeing more and more people like that who 
again, not just opiates, it also can be alcohol, but people who seemingly have successful lives but are dealing with, it, with real addiction. And those, those high need folks uh, occasionally are pretty good at bluffing their way through and saying, I don't really have a problem, and you don't recognize those as potential people for your drug court. And those, those high need folks that might be low risk are, I think, becoming more and more prevalent in the population that we see in our drug courts. That's true, and thank you for reminding me of that. And I want to get to that in a, in a, in a few slides about why why someone like that uh, uh, either doesn't need to be in drug court or needs to be in drug court by themselves. So I want to I want to come back to that. Thank you for reminding me. I want to go uh, and, and talk a, a little bit about data right now, um, and in regard to to building your gate and high risk and high need. Um, remember, um, high risk is not high is not violent necessarily, and I'm not suggesting you take people with violence. But I want to show you this just for illustrative purposes, and show you. Um, and, and my thanks to uh, NPC Research and Dr. Shannon Carey, who I have mined a lot of her uh, distillation of data in this presentation and um, uh, attributed to her. But this is for example, you, you take, if you, for the drug courts that take violent people, they don't have worse outcomes. Uh, they do not have, they have relatively equivalent reductions in recidivism. Uh, and, and that tells you that, that and the reason I put this in here is, again, not because I suggest you take people who are violent offenders. In fact, you have to be very careful about that. But what I'm trying to show you is that what we thought in the old days, the first-time offender, uh, the person that's not really that addicted, uh, the person that still has, uh, you know, some, some what we call good and uh, quote-unquote qualities, uh, family and stuff that Christine was just talking about, um, you know, some of those beliefs were wrong. Uh, as far as outcomes in drug court uh, um, show. And this is just, just to buy, for, again, for illustration, uh, I've shown uh, an issue with regard to violence. Next slide. Uh, drug courts that exclude participants with serious mental health problems have less cost savings. Uh, and I want to suggest that, uh, that, that while this has been less, this is getting to be less and less a concern with regard to drug courts, uh, I know that there are drug courts out there that still say, well, we're not going to deal with people who are doing diagnosis. That's just too much for us to, to bite off. Let's, let's, let's pick someone that we have a chance of uh, uh, that will have a better outcome. Um, and it, you know what? It, it, uh, first of all, you have a problem uh, of what is a serious mental health problem. The second is, is how do you um, determine people have serious mental health problems? Um, the, the third is how you screen those. Out. There's all kinds of issues with this, but one thing that we do know is that if you try to do this, you're going to have less cost savings. And cost savings in these slides is determined by um, someone who similarly situated who uh, completes a drug court versus uh, a similarly situated person that doesn't complete drug court. And there's a lot of calculus that goes into this, uh, jail days in bed, um, the price of the treatment, uh, the, the, the cost of, uh, of your salaries and the judge salary and the public defender salary uh, utilized in here. Um, but in the long run, uh, putting people who have, uh, or not putting people who have mental health problems in your drug court, that is one of the legs, if you will, of a high needs person, uh, one being substance abuse disorder and the other being um, uh, other mental health disorders. Uh, you're not going to have as much impact. Um, you're not going to save as much ta taxpayer money, uh, and um, and by the way, that is a big function of of recidivism. It's not the same uh, measure, um, but if you recidivate more, your cost savings, of course, go down, down, down. All right, next slide, please. Uh, drug courts that accept participants with non-drug charges have nearly twice the savings, uh, because again, if you're looking for someone who has the most impact on your community. You want the most bang for your buck out of putting someone into uh, this high intensity uh, intervention program that we call drug court. Um, uh, just taking people with drug uh, possession charges uh, is not going to save you as much money. In fact, it saves you half as much money as if you take uh, other crimes that are motivated by uh, substance abuse. Now, I don't mean to, to say uh, a DUI homicide or something like that. Uh, but again, a hot check, uh, 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 property crimes, uh, burglaries, annoyingly concealing stolen property, uh, passing bogus uh, uh, 
bills is a, is a big thing around here. Um, uh, those type of things are going to give you a higher cost savings. Uh, so as you design as the gatekeeper, uh, you design your gate. Uh, one of the things that you, you don't want to focus on is just the door that these folks come through the criminal justice system um, uh, under. Um, you want to look at the person. You want to look at the risk and need level uh, and not just the offense. Now, the offense can exclude somebody for drug court. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that is uh, the case at all. A violent offense can very well exclude you from drug court. Um, but if you accept non-drug charges, you're going to be better off uh, with regard to your cost savings and, and as, uh, as a product of that, your recidivism. Next slide as well. I'd like to add that if you are if you're if you're in early days with your drug court and you are working on your criteria, to really concentrate on offender criteria rather than offense criteria. And as Mike said, you know there are certain things that are excluded from drug court, and um, and rightly so. But really. Instead of looking at, oh, this might be violent or this, this is more dangerous or th that kind of thing, look, look at the offender and, and trust your uh, measuring tools as far as that's concerned. Absolutely. Um, next slide, please. Now I want to go back to something that, that Christine raised earlier and, and reminded me of, uh, and she talked about um, the heroin epidemic uh, in parts of our country and how that is affecting people who otherwise wouldn't be in the criminal justice system necessarily. The nurse, uh, to go back to one of Christine's examples, um, the, one of the things that, that you've got to do, uh, and I can't tell you I can, uh, that you should take high risk, high needs. I can tell you that's the best bang for your buck. I can tell you that um, uh, you can have the most effect on your program by taking those folks. Um, but even if you're not, even if you want to take that nurse that Christine was, was describing who uh, got addicted because of a bad back and she had access and so maybe she's stolen and so maybe she's had some forged scripts and, you know, that type of thing. But she has, you know, maybe not the risk factors that uh, someone who is uh, – um, lying in a shooting gallery and, and gets raided, arrested in a raid there. Um, you know, she doesn't look as risky. She's not going to be as risky. She's not going to score as high on a risk need assessment. She's more likely to be high needs and low risk. Well, this slide is all about how come you don't put that person with an addict of many, many years who has burned all those bridges that we've talked about, who is living uh, literally under a bridge, uh, for example, who has had numerous arrests. Uh, I think of a guy that I remember very well who's a drug court graduate that uh, was arrested in a car wash. He was stark naked on a Sunday morning, and I, I think he was trying to take a shower at the car wash is the only thing we could figure out. He had 168 loaded meth syringes, and they weren't for sale. He was using them himself, and he had just passed out, and he was living in his car. He hadn't had a job in years. His family had disowned him. That high-risk, high-need person doesn't need to be mixed with the nurse that, that Christine just talked about. Uh, you can certainly take that nurse into a drug court program. I'm not saying that is the is, is, is but you don't mix them with you don't miss you don't miss mix risk levels. You don't mix high risk with low risk. You don't mix high needs with low needs. Now let's think about that for a moment. I got into a very heated argument with a judge within the last year um, at a state drug court conference. Um, and one of the things that we were arguing about is I put people who are good people in with the addicts so that they can see what what being a good person is and their goodness can spread to the other the other people. And I told them that's not what the data indicates. The data indicates that risk is contagious. And that needs are contagious. If you've got high risk, high needs, and you're put with low risk, low need people, you're going to end up with a high risk, high need population. And if you think about whoever raised you, they told you not to hang out with the bad kids, right? Um, they knew, your mom knew, or your father knew, or whoever it was that raised you knew that if you hang out with the bad apples, you're going to become a bad apple, no matter how good of a person you are. It's just... Uh, it's replicated in, in study after study with regard to psychology about, about this. So let me be very clear about this. Um, if you're not 
it, you don't have to buy it into high risk, high need, like I said. Um, but you've got to buy into this. You don't mix risk and need levels because you're creating a homogenous, high risk, high need population. And I'll even go further and say, if you're not determining risk and need, uh, and therefore you are necessarily mixing that population most likely, you're malpracticing. Um, you are hurting those people uh, that are uh, 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 that that are low risk or that are low need. Uh, they're going to become worse. And I think whether you're a doctor uh, or you're a lawyer like we are, your first job should be do no harm. And if you're risking those people, you're doing harm. If you're mixing them in court, if you're mixing them in treatment, if you're mixing them in probation, uh, that's really problematic. Um, so if you're not determining risk and need or if you're mixing risk and need that you know, uh, go back and look at this. This, this. if I could just give you one slide, um, this is the one that I want you uh, to look at. And, uh, and I'll tell you that even though I didn't have the benefit of this slide or the data that's come out in this, uh, I committed this in. Uh, when we started our drug court, like I said, we didn't understand risk and need, and we put in low-risk offenders with people who were high-risk offenders, and we weren't thinking about that. And we had a lot of failures, uh, and I think we did a lot of harm to people uh, who were, who were uh, lower-level offenders that got uh, stuck in there with uh, higher-need offenders. So just be very cognizant of this. Christine? Uh, I would just add a, a little anecdote. Uh, of course, all of us who were doing drug court 15 years ago were, were making big mistakes and probably hurting people as well as some of the people that we were able to help before we knew about this. But yeah, you know, that nurse that I was telling you about, we were really proud of ourselves because we were so lucky that we had gender-specific treatment. We have a treatment provider here in town that's just for women. and so. We thought, well, you know, that's that's so forward thinking and we're so lucky. And unfortunately, we were putting all the women in the same treatment center and in the same groups and in, and uh, they all they all became fast friends. And, you know, the nurse who the first time she came to court looked like a um, suburban housewife, uh, within a month or six weeks came to court looking not like that at all, uh, looking like, um, the high risk and high needs women that she was in treatment with. And she, uh, you know, was proudly showing us her new tattoos and her new wardrobe and her new hairstyle. And it was, it was a dramatic transformation. And that's, that, that sort of made us think twice about who we were sending to hang out with who. Uh, the, the high risk, high needs folks were not turning into middle-aged housewives. Uh, just the opposite was happening. So that, that was a very, very obvious uh, example of this concept. But if, if you've got young people with low risk, low needs profiles and you're putting them in a group with, with you know, the old timers, um, they're not going to convert the old timers. It's going to go the other way. Absolutely. And you might say, well, geez, a small town like I'm from, from Bristol, Oklahoma, how do you keep those people apart? And, and quite frankly, you know, it's impossible. It's a, it's a, uh, it, it's a, it, it's a, it's it's a, it's a goal. Uh, you've got to strive for it as closely as possible. You'll never hit a thousand. Uh, uh, you can, uh, uh, fortunately, in my program, we've got enough high risk, high need offenders. We don't mix people hardly anywhere. And if we do, it's a very, very, very short period of time in court. Sometimes you will have to do that, but minimizing it is the best you can you can do. Uh, putting them together in treatment is uh, is the worst thing you can do. Uh, putting them in probation together is the, wherever they spend the most time together. That's the most problematic uh, time of mixing them uh, up to court, where you spend probably very little time. Um, let me go to the next slide a little bit. And let, I didn't know where to stick this in, but I, I find this to be one of the more important slides as well. Um, it is uh, it, if you're building your gate. Um, uh, you've got to have this. Uh, you've got to have this in mind, and we know this from data as well uh, that African Americans, and I suspect uh, all per persons of color, are underrepresented and graduate at lower risk or at lower rates, excuse me, than other people in drug courts. 
Um, I don't, I'm not even going to try to figure out why that is. Uh, it, it just is. We've got to work on it. We've got to do better. We have an affirmative obligation, I believe, uh, equal protection wise to, uh, to investigate our programs and see if we are doing this. I, I can tell you that um, uh, we do a pretty good job of letting people in, uh, 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 persons of color in are not underrepresented, but they do not complete uh, the program as well as others. And that is something we are constantly striving uh, to improve on. And so uh, I, I just want to throw this up there and say, hey, this is a red flag. Keep this in mind. Uh, if you look for an Achilles heel of drug courts or the therapeutic uh, court uh, movement in general, this is, I think, the major, uh, uh, the major weakness right here. I'd, I'd agree with that totally. And I, I think that, again, this is, a, this is a whole webinar in and of itself, perhaps on implicit bias. And Absolutely. A few years ago, we started realizing that a big part of the profile of our drug court participants uh, was being neglected, and that was uh, trauma, trauma-induced uh, behavior. And, and that was just something that we hadn't really thought about that much. And that's, that's really become a big part of our treatment and our screening and our focus, and I think that it's been, that concern has now been replaced by this concern, the, the fact that we are, we're bringing people of color into the programs that for whatever reasons they are not successfully graduating. And, I, and working, working through some implicit bias training is certainly something that I would recommend to any drug court, to every drug court. Good, good. And like she said, that is a, a webinar in and of itself. So uh, we're gonna move a little bit faster now, next slide. Um, I wanted to spend a lot more time on risk and need um, because I think that among our, um, uh, our profession, uh, understanding risk and need, uh, no matter what risk need profile you choose in your program, uh, is, is, is vital. And I think that understanding not to mix those risk and, and need profiles is vital. Um, but right now, I just want to talk to some general, do some general things uh, with regard to practicing um, our profession uh, in a drug court, uh, and so this will move a little bit uh, a little bit quicker. And I'm going to go a little bit uh, quicker, Judge Carpenter. So um, I, I know that you you will and can jump in when you need to. Uh, this is not about building the gate to begin with, or actually uh, determining your uh, target population to risk and needs and other factors. Uh, this is actually working uh, in a drug court program. Uh, that the next uh, the remainder of the slides. Uh, so a good gatekeeper is a good gatekeeper while um, while you're in drug court, while you're assigned to drug court, while you want to be in drug court. Next slide. The first thing that we do is we put the adversary um, system in, in, in proper context. That old non-adversarial approach uh, that's talked about in uh, ten, uh, 10 key component number two. Um, it does not mean that we don't go to gudgels with people on our team. Uh, I think that prosecutors, uh, one of our gifts or one of our charges, whatever you want to call it, is holding people accountable. And that's not just offenders, uh, not just participants in a drug court program. Uh, it is uh, treatment, making sure they use evidence-based best practice, um, uh, that they do the things that we tell them to do uh, or, or we expect them to do or we contract with them to do, uh, not mixing, mixing uh, need levels would be an, an example. Um, making sure that probation does what it's supposed to do, um, uh, cajoling and uh, whatever we need to do uh, with regard to judges, to having them uh, uh, do the proper sanctions and incentives. It's not just the public defender or defense counsel on the other, at the other table. Um, uh, we can go to gudgels with them, all of these people, all of our teammates, but it's done outside the, the, the guise of the courtroom uh, so that our participants don't see this, they don't see divisions of the team, uh, once a decision is made, finally, by the judge, based on all the in, in, input uh, or uh, uh, made by treatment or made, you know, whatever, uh, we're there to support that. Uh, we, may, uh, we may go to the mat with folks and arguing uh, our position, uh, but once that position is stated on the team, uh, we, we're, we're with that, we live that, we, we support that, and, uh, uh, and we keep our adversarial system uh, outside of the drug court uh, theater, if you will. Next slide. 
part of that uh, uh, adversary system uh, that's hidden away from our participants is advocating for effective sanctions um, and incentives. Uh, there are consequences for participant behavior. They're predictable, fair, consistent. Um, they're done with evidence-based principles. Uh, we, uh, uh, we do things that is most likely to change their behavior. If they're high risk, high needs, we want to change a lot of their behaviors. Um, that is uh, necessarily done uh, on the grassroots level by uh, the proper uh, 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 imposition of, of sanctions and incentives. Next slide. All right. So we've got these, we've got three possibilities, and I want to mention one of those possibilities here is therapeutic adjustments. Um, you know, um, it, 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 I've joked around with people before, and I said, you know, um, if I told you something, like if you came to me and said, I am a little nauseated and I'm, I'm, I'm not keeping food down and my abdomen hurts and I'm just, I just, I've got a little fever, um, I'm not qualified to say you have appendicitis and I'm certainly not uh, uh, qualified to, uh, to remove your appendix. Uh, but yet we in drug courts, uh, and I've seen this time after time, uh, this is by and large a sin of judges, uh, Christine, but not necessarily alone. Um, we're not qualified to say someone needs inpatient unless people who are qualified to say that say they need inpatient. Um, I've seen programs that require inpatient up front. I don't know how or why you would ever do that uh, uh, without making sure everybody who comes into your program needs inpatient. Uh, it is just not a it is not a best practice to to start off with the heaviest dose of treatments that you can get. Also, we are not, um, uh, you know, we're not qualified to make those adjustments. Let treatment increase the dosage of treatment, the, the, the quality of treatment, uh, the type of treatment um, uh, to help change behaviors. We're going to sanction non-compliant behaviors and incentivize compliant behaviors, not adjust people's treatment. If treatment wants to adjust people's treatment, we'll be, we'll be uh, all in line as, with the team members on that. Um, we might suggest things, uh, but they are the ones that make that call. And in the early days of drug court, we had several people literally die uh, because um, uh, drug court teams, I'm not going to blame the judge on this because I don't know this, but drug court teams said, well, if you're going to be in drug court, you're going to be abstinent from everything. You need to stop using that methadone. And they didn't make allowance for withdrawal. They didn't make allowance for, uh, for other issues. They didn't know about what needed to be medically detoxed and the like, and people died. Uh, so be very, very careful about that, and that is a word to the wise uh, as well. Uh, next slide. So before we leave that totally, I, I would like to say that I think it's important just to make sure that the therapeutic adjustment is part of the conversation. And as, as Mike said, even though uh, a lot of people, including judges, think that they're great at being diagnosticians, um, they aren't qualified to do that. But, but the point is that I think we spend a lot of time in our, in our team staffings talking about how we're going to respond to participant behavior with either an incentive or a sanction. And, and we, we're trying very hard to get the appropriate sanction. We're trying to make sure it's graduated. We're trying to make sure you know, we follow all the guidelines that we've been given. And then we move on. And I, I think it's important that at some point when you're discussing a sanction that you say, why did this happen? Why did, why did this behavior occur that requires a sanction? And is there some therapeutic response to this that we should be thinking about? We're, we're, we're not just responding to behavior, we're trying to change behavior. And a therapeutic response is usually necessary. It's not up to the team necessarily and particularly just the judge, to decide what that therapeutic response is. But it should always be considered, and you should always throw that to treatment and say, what, what is it that we're not doing? What can we add to this person's treatment plan or change that's going to help us not have to decide on a, this sanction again in the future? Absolutely, an excellent point. And that's what I was trying to say earlier, maybe not as articulate as Judge Carpenter just did, but, you know, we, while we don't make therapeutic adjustments, we try to hold treatment, you know, to their feet to the fire. Why aren't 
You know, what can we offer them? What are we missing? Just like Christine said, yeah, absolutely. So we can be part of that discussion, but uh, don't want to make the obviously the uh, uh, the end decision. So uh, uh, let's let's talk about sanctions and incentives. Uh, we're going to talk about it uh, uh, next to risk need that we're going to spend the most time on that. And I want to talk about uh, uh, some best practices in that regard because I, I tend to think that what I see most often throughout the country is, uh, and this is no, uh, this is uh, again not an indictment of, of, of you if you do this, but. Uh, because, you know, if you do it, it still works better. But it, it, we need to have some rules of thumb. And those rules of thumb are evidence-based um, um, ideas of how to change behavior. And one of the things that I talk about, uh, one of the first rules of thumb I want to talk about is that when sanctions are imposed immediately after noncompliance, uh, you have 100% increase in cost savings, that includes recidivism, over if you just do it later on. And I'll tell you what, what that is, and you all know this, and uh, that if you try to correct your, 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 your child, um, you don't wait three weeks until uh, after the noncompliant behavior before you correct them. Uh, they may have done good, good things in between, and that is a very confusing thing to the human mind. So if you're noncompliant, if you test positive, that needs to be responded to with a sanction immediately. If you have done something fantastic, you've been clean and sober for for 30 days for the first time in years. That needs to be responded to immediately. Uh, that should be positively reinforced because something might happen right after that and they, they use again and then we'll, we'll sanction that. Um, but we don't want to miss that opportunity to pat someone on the back to incentivize uh, compliant behavior. So um, the, the takeaway from this is, is that uh, as uh, 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 for a high risk, high need person uh, especially, you need to have a lot of court uh, hearings with this person. Uh, they need to be there frequently. There's data that says that uh, uh, they need to come uh, at least um, uh, semi-weekly, every other week, uh, in the first in the first two phases, or the first uh, 90 days or so. Um, so the implication is is frequent court reviews uh, and quick responses uh, to both compliant behaviors incentives and responses to non-compliant behaviors that is sanctions. Next uh, slide, please. Drug courts where team members have a copy of sanctions and incentives, they have a higher cost savings. Um, what I mean by that is they have a menu in front of them at your staffing. You actually have physically um, a, a written menu of what your available sanctions and incentives are. Um, if you do that, and it's, this is almost miraculously to me, uh, you'll have better outcomes. Uh, everybody knows what's available. Now, this does not mean, by the way, <coughs> excuse me, that for uh, non-compliant uh, event A, you get uh, sanction X. Uh, it is not an algorithm um, because what if I am non-compliant and Christine is non-compliant on the same uh, the drug court docket, what motivates her to change is going to be different than me. We're different sexes, we are different ages, we come from different places, we have different interests, uh, we're two different human beings. Uh, and so choosing from the menu uh, is the way to deal with our compliant, our non-compliant behavior, even if the non-compliant behavior is the same. Um, but you, if you have those written sanction incentive um, a la carte menus in front of you, if you will, your team will operate better with regard to your outcomes. Next slide. This is sometimes hard for prosecutors to accept. Um, I can tell you that I have spent my adult life uh, being a cog in a wheel incarcerating people and being the maybe even the driving force in that regard. I've, I've tried hundreds of jury trials. I've tried numerous capital cases. I, uh, incarceration works. Uh, I told you about the 70% of people who come to the criminal justice system. The incarceration or the threat of incarceration uh, uh, it, it, or, or, or a penal response from the state uh, changes people's behavior. <coughs> Pardon me. But we have to be judicious about how we do this. Uh, now, what this slide shows is that if you do a one or two day or a three day uh, sanction for a non compliant event, uh, it will decrease your recidivism. You're above the line, uh, it has an effect on people. If you start to use it in too large of a helping, 
Uh, and the, the helping is three days. If you use more than that at a time, you're going to be counterproductive. Uh, you're actually going to increase recidivism. Now, why in the world would you want to do that? Now, don't, don't mix this up and say, um, well, we've given you three overnight sanctions in, in a row uh, uh, over the last month that we can't give you another one because Mike Leffler said that too much jail was too much. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about at a time. So if I have a positive test uh, today and next month and the month after and the month after, uh, it's okay uh, to give me uh, uh, four or five days in jail as a total. I'd suggest to you, you might want to start looking at something else to change my behavior because that's not working. Uh, <coughs> but it's not running afoul of this statistic. Um, flash incarceration. In fact, one of the, um, uh, this has nothing to do with uh, drug courts, uh, but one of the, one of the emerging um, data-driven things in the law is, is flash incarceration on numerous occasions more effective than long-term incarceration? And some of the early data says that it is. And here's some data that says, in fact, flash incarceration is, uh, is superior to longer terms of incarceration. You might think, well, gee, this is his third positive test. Let's give him 10 days in jail. And the fact is, is human beings are very adaptive uh, they can adapt from living to pole to pole, uh, every latitude, longitude, in the middle of the ocean, uh, in prisons, under the water. And, you know, we are amazing at that. Uh, and we can adapt certainly to a few days in the county jail. Uh, if you've ever been in a jail, and thank goodness I've only been in jails to interview witnesses, but the most jarring time of that is when the door shuts behind you. Uh, and that's going to have the most effect, and the further you get away from that, uh, the less effects, I believe, that you're going to have on, on behavior. And this graph shows that. Christine? I, I'd just like to reinforce what you said about the length of time in jail. And, and I, I've, I've worked with many teams that their understanding of graduated sanctions is a little bit of jail, a medium amount of jail, and a lot of jail. And, and jail is jail. So don't, don't look at the length of time in jail as necessarily filling the requirement of a graduated sanction. The being, in, being in jail should be pretty close to the end, and it should be hard to get that sanction. You, you can be a lot more creative about your sanctions than just one day, two days, three days. And, and I would also, I, I think this might be stepping on a slide that's coming up three or four away from us, but you know, the prosecutor's role is also probably the strongest link to law enforcement of any other member of the team. And, I mean, traditionally, prosecutors and law enforcement officers work together. And when, you, when you're throwing people to the jail for 24 hours, 48 hours, or 36 hours, you need to also think about the impact that's having on your jail. You know, it might take a couple hours to book somebody in and to process them out. So out of that 24 hours, three or four are, are, are taking up your jailer's time. Your prosecutor needs to make sure that the jail understands why you're using jail as a drug court sanction. Uh, you need to be careful about how much you use it if you want to keep a good relationship with your jail, your jail law enforcement folks. And, and that's something that I think the prosecutor can be really helpful with, with making the jail personnel, your sheriff and deputies, understand why you're putting this person in jail, why drug court uses jail but to try to make it as, as seldom as possible. Right. And there are other things that change person's behavior. Now, jail changes people's behavior, but just understand that the dosage uh, above three days does not, change, uh, does not change behavior other than in a bad direction, in a noncompliant direction. Uh, okay, next slide. We are going to move a little bit quicker here uh, because we're going to move uh, from sanctions. The last sanction slide is just termination. Uh, if you build a gate in, of course, there has to be a gate out. And we hope that gate is uh, changing behavior and graduating and lifelong sobriety and crime-free lifestyle and public safety. But there is this other door, and uh, that's termination, uh, where you can't, uh, where someone is not progressing. They voted with their feet. They've moved away. Uh, I, you should have, just as you have uh, 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 built a gate to come in, there's got to be things that get you out. And my only suggestion in that regard is uh, 
Uh, it should be a small door. It should be restricted. It should be hard to get out of. Um, uh, you should make it difficult to fail out of your program. These people have been uh, successful at failing out of uh, things their entire lives. Um, unless they vote with their feet and walk away, um, it should be otherwise very, or they commit some horrendous above the fold in the newspaper crime. It should be hard to get out of your program. Next slide, please. All right, let's move a little rapidly. Uh, drug court is a prosecutor is a good teammate, teammate, excuse me, teammate. Next slide. The first thing that a good teammate does, according to my little league coach and my uh, every baseball coach I ever had, every coach, every show up. Uh, and here we show a, a slide showing data that if you show up, uh, the change in uh, uh, in uh, 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 or cost savings, excuse me, uh, more than doubles. Uh, if you just show up, I don't know why that is. Maybe it is the appearance of authority, of accountability. Uh, maybe it is your wisdom and sanctions, whatever it is, showing up makes a difference. So don't just build the gate and the gate in and the gate out and then, and then walk away and hope that it works out well. Uh, you've got to get in the pen with them. Uh, you've got to wrestle the steers in the pen. Uh, you've got to push them in. You've got to push them back in. You've got to push them out. Um, a good team member shows up. Next slide. Uh, Christine talked about this a little bit. We are traditionally law enforcement. Next slide. Um, having a law enforcement person on the team uh, improves by a factor of almost two here. Uh, the success in your program with regard to cost savings, um, they are not going to come on their own. Uh, generally speaking, they are going to come through you as the prosecutor. Uh, so be an evangelizer, if you will. Go out and talk to your law enforcement about what drug court does, like Christine says, what it's going to save them, what's in their best interest. Uh, but also recruit someone to be on your team, uh, to be a law enforcement liaison, because it almost doubles your cost savings and your outcomes improve. Next slide. All right. Um, this is this is kind of hard to explain, except in kind of an ephemeral way. I don't have any uh, necessarily any data uh, to support this, uh, although we know that drug courts that uh, attend trainings have better outcomes. Uh, so tr prosecutors must be better if they have training. But you've got to be sharp. Uh, you've got to be up on things. If kratom is the new drug, if uh, methamphetamine is the new drug in your jurisdiction, if heroin is becoming a problem, why heroin became a problem. Uh, what they're mixing heroin with, fentanyl, or whatever it is. These things are these things are important. And a lot of times you'll bring these to the team and you'll know before your other team members. You've got to stay up on research and uh, be knowledgeable about addiction and psychopharmacology and all those things. And to a certain extent, I know I'm preaching to the choir because you all um, uh, are, uh, uh, are still on this panel, uh, that only three of the 60 of you have left. It shows that you want some training. But... Uh, so I congratulate you, and this is what you need to do to stay sharp, uh, continue listening to the other voices, watching the data, uh, looking for new risk needs assessments, understanding uh, new uh, new concepts within the drug court world. Because let me tell you, uh, from the perspective of being a drug court prosecutor for 21 years, the stuff we do now is a sea change from what we started with. We are much more effective. We did good work in the 90s. Uh, we are doing exceptional work now, and I expect in 10 years uh, when I won't be around, Christine, uh, by the way, uh, that we'll be doing even better work as prosecutors. Next. Um, if you build the gate while you may not be there with the turnstile letting people in and out, like St. Peter, as I talked about, uh, it's important to, to hold people accountable. Christine and I both talked about that. Uh, but you need to monitor progress in your program. Are you letting the right people through the gate that you built? Are you letting others in? Are you excluding people? I uh, remember the slide on uh, 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 racial disparities that I showed you earlier. Uh, those things that we have to get uh, we have to get a hold of. And uh, um, judges are great at doing this, but I, prosecutors have a little bit more leeway politically uh, than some other people on our team. And I, I think that it's very important to make sure that your program is monitored uh, by you and professional evaluators, and making sure that you are in fact uh, meeting the goals that you want on your drug court team. Um, one of the things that I've always thought that, uh, that, that we do and we do well is we give legitimacy 
to uh, uh, to the drug court program. Uh, if the prosecutor says that, look, this is what's uh, costing our community money and time and treasure and lives, uh, and this is how we're going to deploy against that, uh, in addition to the other traditional tools we have, jails, prisons, fines, uh, uh, probation, and the like, um, then we need to go out and tell people about it. Uh, you have to be an advocate for this model. Uh, you need to be able to say that it does work. That goes to the prior slide. Uh, you need to be able to say we're going to do better in the future. Uh, that's one of the prior slides as well. Uh, so uh, you've got to be an astute politician uh, to go out and do this, because a lot of times your judge can't. Uh, your judge can't advocate uh, for resources, for example. Uh, your judge has a hard time responding if there is an incident like one of your participants uh, does something uh, that's spectacularly stupid. Uh, it is the prosecutor that needs to be and should be and will be inevitably out in front uh, to explain why this is and what's being done to fix it and uh, why this uh, why this program is what it is. And also, let me tell you that there has been nothing more politically valuable to my office than having these therapeutic courts over the last 20 years because, as some of you I know are having heroin epidemics, we had the same with methamphetamine uh, in the 90s and early 2000s. And uh, this response uh, was politically probably the best thing that we, we ever did. Uh, but we certainly uh, clued people in on them and told them what we were doing and why we were doing it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this goes very, uh, very well. This is, uh, goes to the prior slide about showing up. Um, you, you know, I like to think that I'm the world's greatest uh, trial lawyer, which I, I know in the back of my mind is not true. Um, but uh, using, using advocacy skills, whether uh, uh, you are trying to uh, talk to the Rotary Club or you're uh, uh, talking to your team members or you're uh, uh, advocating for in front of the, in the court, uh, in, a, in a traditional or non-traditional setting. Uh, that doesn't go away here. That's what we do. Uh, we are prosecutors. Uh, we are advocates. You can't tire us out. We will not go away. We will not stop. We might change our minds, as I've uh, talked about how we've changed our program over the years. Um, but you're always there pushing it. You're pushing accountability, efficiency, public safety, uh, uh, fidelity to the model, and, and the like. Next slide. Um, I'm going to come back to where I started with. I'm gonna, the last two slides are about ethics. Um, they always they always tell you that in any uh, uh, program for lawyers that you want to talk about uh, at least ethics and give a nod towards ethics, and this is uh, this is it. And uh, I think that's wise uh, sage advice as well. Is we always remain scrupulously ethical. Um, again, I'm probably preaching to the choir because you. Uh, taking your lunch hour, if you're in the central time zone, or um, uh, you've taken an hour and a half out of your uh, busy morning or afternoon, depending on your time zone, uh, to, to talk about this or listen to this at least and ask questions later. Um, but, uh, you know, we've got to understand that we still, um, we, we've got to root for these people. We're going to safeguard their rights. Uh, we're going to hold them accountable. Uh, we're going to try to make our program more uh, less racially uh, disparate. And all these things that we've talked about. Um, but also, uh, we keep our distance. Uh, we are not going to, uh, 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 you know, give to people rides to court or um, uh, see people after hours in a social setting or things the like. And we've had some spectacularly uh, 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 stupid things that people have done. Uh, and, I, and, again, I don't want to belabor this point. Um, but uh, the simple uh, 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 test that I use is if you'd be ashamed to tell people about it, don't do it. Uh, in Oklahoma, we've had an assistant DA who, uh, um, uh, or assistant prosecutor in drug court, uh, who was having uh, relationships, uh, inappropriate sexual relationships with participants. Um, that's about the worst example that I can give you. Um, but understand, that person probably never intended to do that when he went into that, uh, into that role. Um, you've got to understand that, that regardless of how much you care about this, uh, how much you care about this model, how much you care about the people in your, um, uh, in your program, how much you want them to succeed so that you succeed and they succeed and no one goes that we put the right people in prison and, uh, and the like, 
uh, your ethics remain the same. Next slide. Nothing changes in that regard. Uh, we are still the person that wears the white hat. Um, our relationships with our participants are above board. Our obligations to the court are above board. We don't you know, ex parte communicate with the judge any more here than we would in any other criminal case or the like. And those are just some examples uh, with regards uh, uh, to ethics. Uh, um, just keep that in mind as you as you go through. Don't fall prey to uh, some things that Christine and I may have uh, uh, have seen. Christine, do you want to sum that up? I think you really summed it up well when you said drug court is no different from any other court. Our, all of our ethical constraints remain. Nothing changes. The judicial canons are still in effect. Um, just because it looks different doesn't mean that we need to let our guard down with any of our uh, professional and ethical uh, requirements. And I think that, again, Drug court looks different when you see people coming to the bench and shaking hands with the judge and people being praised and you hear clapping from the courtroom. Uh, it's, it's important that both the court and with the support of the prosecutor and the rest of the team, make sure that everybody still understands that even though we're trying to help you, even though we're providing support and accountability for you, you're here because you committed a felony and this is a court. And that, that's a fine line that we always have to balance on, the fact that we're trying to establish relationships, we're trying to establish trust, provide a safety net as well as a support system, hold people accountable, but at the same time, we're a court. So everything remains the same with regard to our ethical requirements. Final slide, please. All right, so I believe I'm gonna, I'm gonna bounce it back to Anna, and uh, who's gonna uh, open us for some uh, some questions if there are any, uh, or otherwise sum up. Anna, are you there? Yes. So um, thank you guys so much for that presentation. Um, it, to all the um, people attending the webinar, you can submit your questions um, on the bottom right corner of the screen. Um, so we did have um, a couple come in about if these slides and recording will be made available um, after this webinar is complete. And yes, we will be sending out a recording of this webinar along with the slides um, early next week, and those will be found um, on our website, and the video will also be found on our YouTube channel. Um, so one question that came in um, is, what advice do you have for small communities that cannot avoid mixing high-risk and high-need participants. Okay, uh, uh, I, I tried to address that as we got on, but I didn't give it as, uh, I gave it more short shrift than I should have. Um, let, me be, let me be honest with you, because I am from a small community. Um, it's harder in a small community. You have one provider, uh, you may have one judge, uh, one prosecutor, that type of thing. I don't know how small your community is, but it's not quite that small. Uh, it's harder there than it is in a big city with uh, lots of avenues, uh, uh, you know, you have several judges doing several different courts, or as Judge Carpenter does, uh, she does uh, numerous courts in the same in the same courthouse and, and is able to keep people separately. Uh, you do the best you can do uh, is the short answer. Uh, uh, and, you know, I, I tell my kids in baseball, I keep coming back to baseball, but I tell the kids when I coach baseball, I'm like, look, um, you're not going to hit safely every time. You understand that. Um, but you've got to have a different perspective. Uh, you're aware of this. You're aware of this issue now. Um, there's all kinds of things that's more learned and more cogent than what, what I can tell you. Um, and, and, and go and study it uh, and, and see what you can do and do the best you can. Um, it may be your, your treatment people should know this. Uh, and my first thing is I'd go to them and make sure that they are – uh, up on on what we're talking about here, and that they are not, uh, uh, you know, in, in treatment, which is probably the most important place to keep people separate, that they're not putting those people together. Um, you don't put away wolves with sheep. Um, and and if they're mixing people in treatment, uh, you can see that, that that very likely, and go back to the nurse versus the uh, uh, guy that was arrested at the car wash, my guy versus Christine's uh, nurse that, um, um, you know, putting them together is problematic. Do the best you can. If you only have to mix them in court, fine. Um, but here's the problem. Uh, if you have them in court, 
Uh, at the same time, I may be high risk, high need. I'm the guy in the car wash. Uh, if I use, I, you know, in an early phase, you may just uh, do something very light to me. Um, you know, treatment's going to increase my treatment. Uh, you, you might give me some community service, maybe an overnight in jail. Whereas Christine, who is high need, low risk, does the same thing. You're going to want to be a little more punitive with her. Uh, uh, and, you know, she may look at me and say, well, that's not fair. There's a real drug addict uh, who, who got a slap on the wrist, and I got twice uh, in my eyes uh, uh, the response from the team. And so then you start to see how even in court, which is the least dangerous place to do it, how that's problematic to mix those risk and need levels. Uh, so I don't know how to answer your question unless I had all the variables from your, from your, your court. Um, but the bottom line is just be aware of the, of the situation, ameliorate it where you can, do the best you can, uh, and always try to improve. Great, thank you. Um, another question from our audience, is giving jail time initially during sentencing and at the beginning of drug court as ineffective as using it for sanctions? And then um, she goes on to comment, our court is giving 30 to 45 days at sentencing if the participant has not served time prior. Uh, oh, I'd be happy to talk about that one. I, I wish you would. I, yeah, um, it's interesting to me because I, I've seen this exact exact thing and had a response from a non-drug court judge that was very gratifying. The um, our statute requires that if someone has a certain level felony DWI that they have to serve 60 days incarceration, a mandatory 60 days um, as part, even if they receive probation. And we were sentencing people to to their to that and then making drug court or DWI court a condition of their of their probation and usually the deal was that if you if you're going into DWI court you would do that 60 days on home detention or work release or something like that and we we did find that some some judges and some prosecutors were saying no they're going to do that 60 days before they go to treatment and one of our judges who is not a drug court judge, who has not had the training that we've had, said, I don't understand that. Why, if someone needs treatment and we're putting them in a treatment court, why would we let them just sit in jail for, just sit there for 60 days before we get them into the treatment? Because I, what little I do know is that you're supposed to get people into drug court as fast as you can. And so that made a real change in how some of the sentencing uh, judges decided to handle that situation. Putting, you want to get people into court, into the treatment program as quickly as you can as, and in conjunction with the time the crime was committed. And as Mike said earlier, when you're trying to modify behavior, you don't give somebody a consequence a year later. Uh, you've, you've lost a lot of your momentum at that time. So the idea of incarcerating somebody as a condition to come into drug court um, it, it just seems very counterintuitive to me. And jail should be brief. It should be a very high sanction. And, and, and I, just, I think that I would save jail time for when it can make more of an impact than have somebody just sit. I, I agree. I don't think that I could, uh, I could have said that any better. Thank you, Judge. Um, anything else? Um, no, no more questions. Thank you both so much. Um, and to all of our um, participants in this webinar, if you have any further questions, you can contact either the presenters or the Justice Programs Office um, through the information that is on the screen. And again, we will be sending out a recording of this webinar and the slides to everyone who registered for this webinar, and they will be posted on our YouTube account and on our um, website page. Um, so thank you very much, Mr. Leffler and Judge Carpenter, and thank you to everybody who tuned in today. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Good day.